translating and all kinds of other things to do with language. But to do that, to help us in that way, computers need structured data about human languages. They need structured data about human languages to do a good job. And human languages are really complex. If you don't believe me, just think about uh, a language <coughs> other than your native language. And you will realize it's complex. Um, and I'm going to give, give you a few more examples. Is language so complex? Uh, if I ask you, what does dog mean? Do you know? Yes, what does it mean? I'm hungry. I'm hungry? <laughs> what? What does dog mean? A creature. A creature that goes... Four legs. Four legs, legs. woof woof, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, what about this sentence? Guilt began to dog the thief day and night. What does it mean to dog the thief? Maybe some of you don't know this particular verb in English. This is a verb, not a noun. And it means to chase or stalk. So guilt was stalking the thief day and night. It has nothing to do with a four-legged animal that goes woof woof. Well, maybe not nothing, right? It dogs him like a hunting dog, right? I guess that's the metaphor here. But this verb here doesn't mean the four-legged animal. And if I were to translate it into another language, for example, if I were to say in uh, Ukrainian, sobaka, that would be incorrect. That would be a bad translation here, right? Do you agree? So, what does the word bat mean? Which, which one? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're on to me. The English, the English word bat. You know, flying mouse, right? Well, it depends, right? It can also mean the owner hit the burglar with a baseball bat, right? That's an example we know and understand. It's the word bat, but it has more than one meaning, and they're unrelated. The animal and the bat uh, of the baseball are definitely unrelated. What does mean mean? The word mean, mean, meaning, right? Well, it also means he sure was a mean old man. That's a completely different sense of mean, right? Mean, like nasty, cruel. Um, the mean income in her country is lower. That's yet another sense of mean, right? The mean income. So words can have more than one meaning, they can have more than two meanings, we understand. Um, now, when I come and want to choose how to translate this word, if I see the word mean in an English text, theoretically, until someone interprets it, it could mean any one of the senses of mean, right? And you need to kind of read the sentence and figure out which sense of mean is meant here. But if I'm a translator, I need to be the interpreter, not the reader. I need to decide what was meant in the original English text so that I can choose the correct word in my language which uses three different words for the three different meanings of mean. If you've ever done any translation, you've encountered this problem, right? Where you understand that the original could mean either this or that, but you have to choose. Because in your language, it's either this word or that. You cannot just leave it ambiguous and let the reader decide. So this depends on the specific sense of the word, and we determine the specific sense of the word from the context, right? The words around it, the plot so far, everything we know about the text. And this is hard for computers to do. It's hard. Wait, I hear, I, I read your thoughts. I have psychic powers, and I read your thoughts, and you're telling me, wait, but machine translation is a thing, right? Computers do translate texts all the time. We all use it, right? Right. How does machine translation do it? Machine translation relies on um, statistics, not on a careful understanding of the context of the word where it is used. But if you feed machines, modern machines, a huge corpus of text and corpuses of uh, uh, parallel texts, 
and they do all kinds of statistical manipulation on it, computers do in fact manage to produce somewhat edible translations for certain purposes. And here in CEE, a lot of you are speaking languages that have poor machine translation. Right? In, in Western Europe, where they speak French and German, etc., they're used to quite good machine translation. But in many of your languages, machine translation is still quite terrible and produces nonsensical sentences and sometimes reverses the meaning of a sentence. Like literally changes a no to a yes, and that can be disastrous. Why does it do that? Because it is based on this statistical approach. And in fact, I have noticed that in the last few years, uh, Google Translate, for example, is so aggressive in its use of statistics that it sometimes even offers um, translations from another language. You tell it to translate from, I don't know, Polish into English, and it translates a certain word as though it was in Russian, for example. Why? Because statistically, it decided that it is likely that this is that Russian word and not some more obscure Polish word. Google does that because statistics. Uh, and that's uh, quite problematic. But in general, this statistical approach barely understands context. Why do I say barely? It doesn't understand anything. It's a statistical machine, right? But in the statistics, there is some representation to the fact that, oh, if this word appears in close proximity to that word, it's probably in this sense, right? Like if baseball was mentioned, then the bat is probably a baseball bat and not the animal. That's something you can get from statistics. But anything more uh, nuanced or anything that depends on a word in chapter seven, depending on something mentioned in chapter three, the machine will never be able to um, uh, uh, give results based on. And in general, machine translation, and if you've ever tried machine translation on a literary text, rather than on some, I don't know, technical thing, you have noticed how it flattens the, the register of the language. It uses very basic verbs. It tends to lose flavors of meaning. And that is why, of course, we can absolutely not translate poetry using machine translation. And, and in fact, we use machine translation for very ordinary day-to-day -day things things that it doesn't make sense to pay a professional translator to translate, right? I just want to understand what this blog post says. Maybe I don't even need it. You know, I, I read it through machine translation. Oh, yeah, it's not what I need. And it didn't cost me money. That's a reasonable use of machine translation. But it, it uh, falls short in many, many ways. So, yes, it exists. We all use it. It's good for what it is good for. But it leaves a lot uh, to be desired. So language is complex. In addition to words having many senses that we talked about, words also have many forms, right? Those of us who speak languages with cases know all about the complication of forms. And some of the words are irregular, right? Like English go versus went. That's an irregular verb we all know. Some of the words in our languages are archaic. They're in our language, but they're no longer used, right? In English, the example would be thou, right? An old version of you. Nobody says thou anymore, but it is an English word, and it's in English literature. So it's an archaic word. It's not kind of an active use, but it's an English word. <clears throat> uh, we've discussed the fact that words have many senses today, but again, some of those senses may be archaic, may be defunct. We may not realize anymore. For example, the word nice. What does the word nice mean? It means nice, right? Nice, something that is likable, that is... Uh, uh, but originally, in Middle English and onwards, the word nice in English meant sharp. Sharp, keen. Um, and for example, people would make, uh, would say something like a nice distinction, meaning a sharp distinction, right? Not a nice distinction. Uh, so that meaning is kind of gone. Normal English speakers don't know this old sense of the word nice. But if you read 17th century English literature, you will encounter nice in this sense. Um, we also have some regional words in our languages. Words that are only used in a certain region. Right? Like 
uh, Lanyap, uh, a, a, a bonus that you get for buying something, something that the shopkeeper throws in, uh, used in the southern United States, in Louisiana, almost nowhere, nowhere else. No, no, few people know this word, but it's used every day in Louisiana. And as a given sense of a word could have many words, right? So we can we have synonyms, right? We have we can say peak or summit in English. We can say clever or smart, and many other examples. And of course, synonyms are universal phenomena. All the languages have synonyms, and we also have homophones, words that sound the same but don't mean the same and aren't the same word. Like in English, steal, to steal something, versus steal the material, right? They're spelled differently, but they sound the same. And some things are homographs, which means they are spelt the same, even if they don't sound the same. Like read versus read, right? Or lead versus lead, etc. Um, so all of that exists in the English language in this example, but of course in your languages as well. We even have grammar that is uh, dialectal or regional. In English, for example, some users of the language might say, I done saw. I done saw. <clears throat> your English teachers would think this is a mistake. You would not get away with saying this in a test when you learned English, because this is not standard English. This is a dialect of English used mostly by African Americans in the late 19th and early 20th century. Okay? They said, I done saw as a kind of blue perfect, right? A kind of I have seen. Um, but it wasn't a mistake. They all said this. This was a standard part of vernacular African American English of the early 20th century. Um, it wasn't a mistake. It wasn't someone getting it wrong. So we need a way to somehow express the fact that, yes, this is also a grammatical form that exists in English. Um, then, of course, we have the question of the register, the, the diction, right? Not all words are suitable for all contexts. Um, if I say to you, hark, that would be weird. I should just say listen, right? Listen is the word we use every day. The hark <coughs> is an old literary word that means the same thing. It means listen. But I wouldn't say hark, even though it's an English word, uh, most people still understand it, but it's just not used. It's not the right register to use in a lecture um, just like that in 2022. Uh, the word hey, on the other hand, is also not appropriate for me to use in a professional setting, in a lecture, right? I shouldn't say hey, right? no, that's a, that's a different register. And we all know this. Uh, whether, whether or not we know the term register, in our native languages, we all know how to use the appropriate word for the appropriate social context. But if we want to try and document our language, we need to find a way somehow to teach the computer, don't put hey when you're translating uh, a literary text, right? It doesn't mean exactly the same as listen, right? <clears throat> So all of this adds into the complication of language. Uh, and finally, there's also lexical overlap and confusion. Lexical overlap, the same term meaning different things in different regions. In the US, for example, there's the famous confusion about what to call a carbonated drink, like Coca-Cola, right? So like a general carbonated drink. If you don't want to refer specifically to Coca-Cola, you want to say, you know, in, in British English, you might say a fizzy drink, right? But uh, in the US, you don't say fizzy drink. You say a soda in large parts of the United States. And in other parts, you say pop, get me some pop. If you're in the wrong part of the United States and you say, get me some pop, people will look at you and go, what? Get you what? So it's like this super everyday term in one part of the United States for a fizzy drink, and in another part of the United States, nobody would know what you're talking about. And if you tell them, you know, Coca-Cola, Mirinda, whatever, and they say, oh, a soda. And you say, no, a soda is carbonated water. And there would be a whole confusion, right? Um, another famous example is the word fanny. 
Do you know the word fanny in English? <laughs> in American English, a fanny is a, a name for the bum. And in British English, a fanny is the name for the front part uh, in women only. So again, think of the amusing confusion uh, created when uh, people try to speak English across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so these things uh, depend on where you live. Uh, oh, I had another example here, doubt, the word doubt. You know the word doubt? It means I, I disbelieve, I question what you say, or I have uh, strong feelings of disbelief about something you said. Uh, but it was quite a shock to me the first times I was visiting India uh, when I was giving a lecture and someone uh, uh, raised their hand and said, I have some doubts. And it took me by surprise. Uh, to my kind of uh, uh, American English, it felt very aggressive, you know, to tell the lecturer who just t taught you something, I have some doubts about what you just said. It feels very aggressive to American English speakers. An American English lecturer uh, attendee would not say, I have some doubts. They would say, I would like to ask a question, whatever. I have some doubts feels very aggressive. It turns out, in Indian English, doubt just means question. Neutrally. It doesn't have this negative. So uh, 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 an elementary school teacher in India asks his uh, students, any doubts? Any means, any questions. That's just usage, right? That's just how the language is used in India. And once I got used to it, uh, it was fine. So, I hope I've convinced you that language is complex. And even when you think you know a language, uh, and I would say I know English, um, you are always uh, surprised still. And all of this was just at the lexeme level, the level of the individual word. I have given you only examples of individual words, um, oh, except for the uh, dialectal grammar, actually. Uh, well, we're not even getting into the world of syntax, right? of how sentences are put together. That's for another day. OK, so language is really complex. And it means it's going to be very complex to model as structured data, right? Right. It is going to be complex. Uh, but I su suggest to you that it's really worth it, because if we document our languages in a structured way on Wikidata's lexeme, the lexicographical layer on Wikidata, we will enable a sea of innovation, of tools, of features we can't even imagine today. And I'll just spell out for you a few possible things. Um, if we have structured data about our language, we can create language acquisition software, language learning software. Um, for instance, uh, flashcard apps are trivial to create once you have that structured data. Uh, grammar practice, like how to decline a certain noun, how to conjugate a certain verb, computerized, automated, easy to do once you have the structured data. Educational games of all sorts are easy to make. Pronunciation practice, you could have, once you have the structured data, you could have a computer drill you on pronunciation of words to improve your accent. Uh, text reading software, uh, such as for the visually impaired, but also for people who, I don't know, want to be, to, to hear things while they're doing sports or whatever. Uh, if we give it hyper-annotated text, meaning text that has each word's sense identified, not just the word, right, but the specific sense of the word identified, then the text reading software can read it more intelligently with the right tone, etc. Um, and many more uh, kinds of language acquisition uh, uh, features are <coughs> possible. And if we have the structured data, we can also create language analysis and language improvement software, including uh, sophisticated grammar and spelling checkers, more sophisticated than what we have today. Um, for example, today, um, spell checkers work well for languages that have one or two forms per word, 
like maybe in English, for example, you know, you have the form dog, and you have the form dogs, the plural, and that's it. Or maybe the possessive form, dog apostrophe s, right, the dog's bone, okay, and that's it, that's it. Um, but in many other languages, there could be 15, 20, 37, 64 different forms of a single word, depending on its grammatical uh, position. Some languages are agglutinative. They, they glue things together so that, for example, the preposition goes with the word. In Hebrew, my uh, mother tongue, for example, our prepositions are just letters that are added to the word. They're not words in themselves. Prepositions, words like in, on, with, right? are just a letter added to the word, creating uh, many variations. So spell checkers today, current spell checkers, are doing very poorly with languages such as Hebrew because it's hard to fit all the possible forms into the spell checker, so they mark perfectly good words as mistakes and so are less useful tools. Now, for a very competent Hebrew speaker like me, it's just an annoyance that it marks mistakes in words that I know are not mistakes, but for learners, imagine, it's much more serious, that it marks a good word as a mistake. <clears throat> so we will be able to have better spelling and grammar checkers. We will be able to write things like crossword solvers using this, because we would know the senses of words. Um, etymological uh, exploration or research, we would be able to build tools that show us graphs of etymology, right? Where words come from, what words they are like in other languages. Many of you here speak Slavic languages, right? That's a big, big family of languages, and you can track the changes and the variations uh, across the Slavic languages. <clears throat> uh, and you can do all kinds of more advanced stuff like stylometry. Most of you probably haven't heard the term. Stylometry is the science of comparing styles with, with computerized means, right? Like, for example, you can count the uh, frequency of prepositions in a particular text, and then you can prove that this text is or isn't by that author because that author has a known uh, frequency of prepositions. All kinds of interesting things like that are possible. All right, uh, and more and more. Translation will, of course, as I mentioned, depends on the correct sense of the word. And if we have a good uh, structured data uh, about our language, we have an easier time distinguishing the exact sense of the original word, and we can help contextualize it with things like register of the word, is it high or low, etc., um, and would enable better translation. Okay, so <clears throat> it's very, very complicated, it's very, very hard. Now let's make a wish. What if we had a way to describe lexemes, words, very precisely? including all their different forms and all their different senses. And we would be able to say, this is the nominative form, and this is the genitive form, and this one is the imperfect verb, and this is the pluperfect verb. And we would be able to say that this word is regional, and to what region? And that this word is archaic, or this is slang. And what if we were able to say, this one sense of the word translates to this other language this way, but this other sense of the same word translates to this other language in another way, and we will be able to say that. <clears throat> what if we were able to say that this lexeme combines three other lexemes, right? What if we are able to say, for example, uh, I don't know, that the word antihistamines combines anti and histamines, right? Just so that the computer knows that this is a compound word. What if we're able to say that a certain word is derived from another language, right? <coughs> from, from uh, as, a, as a borrowed uh, term. What if we could uh, say that this word denotes, means, a concept that we have an item for in Wikidata? Right? I mean, we have an item, for example, for the word lake in Wikidata, right? Explaining a lake is a, you know, uh, and, and it links, of course, to all the Wikipedia articles about lake, right? But what if we're able to teach the computer that the word ezero 
in Macedonian means lake, and that that word is related to the item, Q whatever it is, right? The, the, the Wikidata item, Q53 whatever, that Ezra in Macedonian means this thing that we have Wikipedia articles about, right? We're able to tie words to uh, concepts that are documented in Wikidata. What if we could also provide example sentences for each such word? And we would be able to say that this example sentence gives an example of this sense and not that sense of the word. Remember, I gave you an example of the word uh, with the baseball bat. I did not give you an example of a sentence with the animal. <clears throat> and what if we could attach audio to each form? showing us how to pronounce it, how to pronounce each form of the word, not just the dictionary form, as many sites already do give us, you know, pronunciations of a word. But some words, you know, change quite significantly when they are, I don't know, in the instrumental plural case or something. And how do I pronounce that? What if we could do that? And what if we could query all of this structured data and ask questions like, what are some nouns that are masculine in Ukrainian but feminine in German? Those of you who know about noun gender understand what I mean. Those of you who do not speak a language with noun gender are having their head explode. Why would nouns have gender? Yeah. Um, what if I could ask, what if I could query and say, what is the etymological graph of the Slavic words for horse, for example? Or, what is the longest word in our language without repeating letters? That's just a silly question, but can you answer it now? It's difficult to answer, but if we had a database that we could query, we could answer it. What percentage of our language's lexemes have we borrowed from other languages, and from which? Interesting questions that are difficult to answer, by the way. If you, if you are looking at these questions and going, well, I never asked myself such a question, I want to suggest to you that you didn't ask yourself such a question because you knew it's very difficult to answer. But if we have such a structured data uh, database, we can answer it easily and we can start asking questions that we never asked ourselves before. We can ask, what are some false friends between our language and another? Do you know what false friends are? Words that sound like they mean the same in another language, but don't. For example, the word gift. In English, it means a present. But in German, it means poison. That's a false friend. Right? And there are many other languages like uh, false friends like that, especially between close languages. Right? For example, within Slavic languages, there are words that sound like, oh, I know that word. It's like my language. It means the same, but it means something else, sometimes awkwardly different. So what if we could generate, before we go and visit that country, what if we could generate for ourselves a list of, I don't know, 200 false friends to beware of, right? That would be nice. So these are all crazy wishes that we're wishing upon a star, right? Uh, and we could also ask, how has this lexeme changed in usage over the years? So that we could, for example, see that the word nice in English is used quite differently if we look at example sentences every 50 years, right? And we can see that at some point, it has a positive meaning suddenly. It no longer means sharp. It suddenly means nice and fuzzy, right? Uh, we, could, we could detect it if we just get a query of example sentences over the years. What if we could do all that? Guess what? Lexine can do all of this right now. Are you ready to become Lexine hipsters? Yeah. Um, in fact, wouldn't it be nice if everyone could speak your language? <clears throat> it would be nice, but until everybody speaks your language, it would be nice if we could benefit in our language from good content written by people in other languages. Uh, and we do this, right, by translating articles. But what if we could do this automatically? Uh, and not by machine translation. What if we could do this by more intelligent translation? At this point, you're saying, okay, Asaf has really lost it. Um, but actually, maybe you've heard of abstract Wikipedia. 
Abstract Wikipedia, the newest uh, project of the Wikimedia Foundation uh, that was uh, started and is led by Denny Vrandecic, uh, who also built Wikidata, so we know he can build amazing things. And Abstract Wikipedia is going to be that. It's going to be to enable us to build abstract articles, articles made up of code. But once we have that abstract representation of knowledge, Abstract Wikipedia will be able to generate human, intelligent, um, uh, accurate, uh, idiomatic text in any language automatically. Any language that is sufficiently well documented in Lexi. Any language that has its lexicon sufficiently well described structured data uh, on Wikidata. Okay, so one of the biggest applications, remember I told you it would enable all kinds of applications, one of the biggest applications of Lexeme is already being developed at the Wikimedia Foundation and it is basically going to give a machine generated but human curated and grammatical uh, versions of articles to especially small or minority languages that just don't have hundreds of thousands of articles. So until they do, until they write themselves hundreds of thousands of articles, they will have abstract Wikipedia as a kind of backup with machine generated but not machine translated um, articles on anything they choose that is uh, available on abstract Wikipedia. So that's one amazing um, application that is already in our near future. They're still working on it. And at this point, you might say, okay, 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 but what is Lexeme? What are you talking about? What are you teaching us? So Lexeme is a layer on top of Wikidata, <coughs> and is running inside the Wikidata site. So it's not a separate wiki, it's not a separate site, uh, but it's just shorter to say Lexeme than the lexicographical layer of Wikidata. But that's what it means. And Lexemes, so Lexeme is like the system, but a Lexeme, or Lexemes in plural, are Wikidata entities that aren't items. Wikidata has items, right? But these are new kinds of Wikidata entities, and they exist in parallel to the items. Items look like this, Q212, for example. Lexemes look like this. L and the number. Okay, so it's very easy to tell apart lexemes from items. Items start with, excuse me, items start with Q and lexemes start with L. And we get all the benefits of the wiki, you know, user pages, talk pages, we can link uh, <clears throat> from Wikidata into Commons, into Wikipedia. Um, and we can use the Wikidata query service, the existing Wikidata query service that maybe you know, uh, to query lexemes, to, to answer these questions that I suggested to you. And lexeme itself, the people working on lexicographical data in Wikidata is still a very small, friendly, and welcoming community, so this is an excellent time to join. In short, lexeme is love. And so we're ready to take a tour of Lexeme and look at the anatomy and sociology of an actual Lexeme. So let's look at this one. <clears throat> let's look at this one. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, this looks like Wikidata. Uh, maybe you're wondering about this uh, color that is not uh, visible on your Wikidata, that's just to remind me that I'm on my staff account. So that's just a little change I made so that I remember which account I'm in because I have a volunteer account and a staff account. So ignore this, this is supposed to be white. But this is Wikidata, as you know and love it. And what we see about this Lexeme, first of all, of course, it has an identifier. In this case, L4177. That's the identifier for this lexeme. This lexeme has a, a title with the word let. 
the word let, and the language is English. So I'm not documenting let in some other language. Other languages also have the word let. No, I'm talking about the English lexeme let. And you can see that we already know that it's the, the lexical category. Can you all read this, the small print, or should yeah. I? No? Let's enlarge it a bit. Uh, that makes it awkward already. Yeah. So, uh, lexical category, verb. So this is a verb in, in terms of parts of speech, right? It's not a noun, it's not an adjective, right? It's a verb. And now, like we have about Wikidata items, we have statements about this lexeme. And we can have as many statements as we want. Here we have several statements. The first one says, instance of, just like a Wikidata item usually has instance of, right? Like Berlin is an instance of city, right? So let is an instance of irregular verb. It's an irregular verb, right? Because we say uh, let, but in the past, what? Also let, right? We don't say let it. We say let, so it's an irregular verb. So Lexi knows that this is an irregular verb. OK, what else do we know about this? We have some usage examples that I'm going to skip, and I'm going to come back to them. What else do we know about it? We know that it is derived from another lexeme. Derived from lexeme. And it's derived from the lexeme Latin. Latin. Have you heard of that word? You shouldn't have. It's Middle English. Latin in Middle English, right? In, in Medieval English, uh, the word Latin is the source of the modern English let. And by the way, we can click through and reach this totally different uh, lexeme, the lexeme Latin, and you can see that it's not English, it's not E-N, it's E-N-M, Middle English. It's a different language, and it's a verb in Middle English, and we have things that we know about Latin, about that lexeme. Uh, let's go back to our original lexeme, though. Okay, so it's derived from some lexeme, and it has a homograph lexeme, a homograph lexi, meaning a lexi that is written the same, and it is indeed written the same, let. Well, what is the homograph lexi? This homograph lexi, you can see, is let the noun. A let. Maybe most of you don't use that noun, but in British English it is, or was, uh, used. A let means something that was rented. Oh, we were living for two weeks in a let by the lake. It's okay that you don't know this sense, but it is a sense, it is a word that does exist. And in this case, it was documented that this noun looks exactly like the verb let, but they're different words. One is a verb, one is a noun, they have different meanings. Okay, what else do we know? We have an OED online ID about this lexeme. OED is the Oxford English Dictionary. So this is an external identifier. This basically tells us that this lexeme, let, is documented in the Oxford English Dictionary under this ID. And if I click it, I get there. Just like on Wikidata, right? You may have seen on Wikidata there's all kinds of external IDs, right? The, the German National Library ID, the French National Library ID, the Encyclopedia, the IMDB ID, whatever, right? So these are some external IDs for our word. And we have the opportunity to add a statement, just like any other Wikidata screen. But then, we have two things that are unique to lexemes, and not to Wikidata items. We have senses, <coughs> and we have forms. Okay? Senses and forms. So let's start with senses. Every lexeme has senses and forms. And a lexeme should have at least one sense, one meaning, right? Um, but it could, and it could have many senses, and it should have at least one form. So in this case, the first sense that, Lex, that uh, Wikidata knows about, you can see it's, it has an idea of its own. So the lexeme of let is L4177. But this particular sense of let is L4177-S1, sense 1. 
right? And the sense is, it's difficult to read because of the size, to allow, not to prevent, right? That's what let means, right? Let me eat, right? <clears throat> to allow, not to prevent. Now, these senses should be <coughs> like little dictionary definitions, but they sh you should use, when you are putting in a sense for a word, and I hope all of you will now start populating lexi with your language, use more than one word. Don't just use a synonym. Precisely because words can have more than one meaning. So if you tell me, oh, this means bat, I don't know if you mean bat as in baseball bat or bat the animal. Do you understand? So try to give the sense in several words, despite the natural tendency to say, oh, this just means that. <coughs> give several words. That's why, uh, and I made this lexeme, that's why I wrote to allow, that's only one word, but then not to prevent, to, to make sure that nobody is confused by some other sense of the word allow. Me. So that's one sense of the word. Now, under this sense, you can see we have statements about Lexing 4177 sense one. So I can now describe and add certain statements specifically about this sense that don't apply to another sense. For instance, a synonym, a synonym for let is permit, right? But it's not just a synonym of let, it's a synonym of let in this meaning. Let has other meanings for which permit is not a synonym. Are you with me? So when we say this is a synonym of that word, we should be careful, we should usually say that it's a synonym of this sense of that word. Moving on. Uh, that's all we have to say about sense one in this case. And we move on to sense two, and sense two is to rent out property to another. The verb to let means to rent out property. You have a spare room in your house, this is British English more than American English. You have a spare room in your house, you have a room to let. You are letting the room. Okay, again, may maybe many of you have not encountered this. Uh, I think it's a bit old-fashioned, but that's a sense of the word to let. And it, as you can see, it's quite different from to permit, to allow. Now, we can imagine how it derives from it, right? Because you're basically allowing someone to live in your property, right? But still, it's different enough that it, it's a different sense uh, when you encounter it in a text. <clears throat> so this is the sense to, let, to rent out another property. And there are no statements yet about this um, about this uh, sense, as you can see. This is just an example lexeme I made up. Uh, I made, didn't make, make up. And there's a third sense. The third sense of the word let. Have you, have, have you thought of this third sense by yourself? When we say, let us go. Right? Let us go. The let is kind of an, a, an exhortative, right? And a self-encouraging. And that's what this says. It produces a cohortative self-encouragement or jussive. These are grammatical terms, cohortative and jussive. And I'm explaining the grammatical terms. Indirect command utterance. So cohortative is when I'm encouraging myself, let's go, or uh, let me take this, right? But uh, jussive, indirect command, is when I say something like, uh, um, let there be light, right? When God said, let there be light, he was giving an indirect command, right? It, 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 like, it means, see to it, someone, see to it that there is light, right? Let there be light. Um, let the games begin, right? These are, this, this is the use of this sense of the verb let. Pause. Are you with me so far? about these three senses of the word let. And of course, this would be more effective if I could demonstrate in each and every one of your uh, mother tongue, but I can't do that, so I'm using English. So moving on to forms, the forms of the lexeme let. And as you can see here, this is no longer surprising to us. We have the lexeme and then F1. That's the first form. 
F2, F3, as many forms as we have. By the way, the order doesn't matter. In this case, we started with simple present, but there's no guarantee that F1 will always be the dictionary form. You know, someone might start a lexeme with the plural dative form. So this first form, the form itself, like what the word looks like, is let, in English, right? Uh, the grammatical features of this specific form is the simple present form of the verb let. And now we have statements specifically about this form. The first statement says, we have a pronunciation audio for you. We can click it. Let. There we go. Now we know how to say let. And this is a pronunciation audio on the form because there are other forms. Oh, and we have here, uh, for example, a little property as well, a sub-property that says that this is American English. Right? You heard a, a lady from the US say it. Let. Let. Right? It's American. Let. Um, and we could add, of course, a British English pronunciation here as well. We also have another statement about this form. In this case, the International Phonetic Alphabet Transcription. Right? And uh, for those of you who can read, the International Phonetic Alphabet. Yeah. yeah, you can see. You cannot see. Yeah. See this character? International Phonetic Alphabet. Okay. So these are two things, two extra things we learned about the form beyond the fact that this is what it looks like and it's present symbol. We also got audio, and we got an IPA transcription for it. And then there's the second form. The second form is let's. Let's. And that is also simple present, but it is third person singular. Right? He lets. So that's a different form. Theoretically, I need an audio file here as well, right? I need someone to tell me that it's pronounced let's. Um, and then there's letting, which is the present participle in English. And then there's let, which is the simple past. Now it's identical in form, right? It's identical to F1. It's identical to F1, but it is a different form. It's the past form. And we need to somehow record it so that the structured data, so that Lexi knows that the past form is also let. Right? We cannot just say, oh, we already have that form in F1 because we said about that, that it's present. We need to say about this one, that it's past. And the past participle in English, right, the third form, um, like uh, do, did, done, right? So this would be the done. Uh, is also let, because it's an irregular verb. Um, but this let is the past participle in English. And again, we could have had specific statements about it here. So this isn't like the most detailed uh, lexeme in the world. Uh, we can look at the other one. Where was it? Oh, usage example. Sorry, usage example. I promised you I'll get back to that. So here's a usage example. Uh, the resolution here is very low, so it makes it a bit difficult. So the usage example for the lexeme let. Here's the example. This is a sentence, a piece of text. Oh, love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. And this is an example of the word let. But in order to help me understand the example, I am told, A, the author of this sentence is George Matheson, a notable person. And now we have a, a, a qualifier or a sub-property. It's really hard to see, and so there we go. We have another property here. I apologize if you can't read it, I'll read it to you. It says, subject sense. And the sense that is demonstrated in this sentence is the sense of let, to allow, to not prevent. Okay, so I'm not just giving you an example sentence. I'm, sen I'm telling you this is an example of the word in this sense. Right? And we have a reference that shows us where we got this sentence from. In this case, it's from um, the Canadian Soldier's Songbook on English Wikisource. 
I literally just looked for some literary example of the word let. I found it in Wikisource, I quoted it, and I put it here. Instead of making up a sentence on, on my own, I could have done that as well, but I think it's better to have a usage example that you can share that is from literature, that people can look up in its context, etc., than for us to make up uh, example sentences. Um, and here's another, so this is another value of the usage example property, so it's another usage example. This one is, let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Uh, this is the opening of a poem by T.S. Eliot uh, that I like, so that's why I used it. But it's also an illustration of let in the sense of introduces a self-encouraging sentence, etc. Right? That third sense. <clears throat> and of course, this is also sourced to a wiki source where that poem exists. And a last example, she had taken her passage for Europe and was very anxious to let the flat before she sailed, right? To rent out the apartment, to let the flat before she sailed. And this is from uh, William Dean Howells, and this, of course, demonstrates the sense of to rent out property to another. So you see here how I'm doing this great service to anyone trying to understand the word let, by not just telling him or her there is more than one sense, but also demonstrating each of the senses with references and everything. Okay, so that was the usage example, and I wanted to show you one more thing. On Latin, the Middle English one, you can see that uh, Middle English has this nice uh, online dictionary, and we have here a property called described at URL. See this? And this leads us to where this lexeme, the Middle English lexeme, is described in this online dictionary. And if we click it, we get to this Middle English site, into the entry about the word Latin, right? So if you, your language, has some uh, big online dictionary that you can link into that has stable URLs, you can also do this when you document lexemes. Okay. Um, yes. Yes. It is uh, possible to... In import many lexemes at yes. one time? Excellent question. Yes, this basically takes us to. Uh, ah, sorry. <laughs> no, no, this is what's called an excellent question. Do you know the definition of an excellent question? Ah, uh, that's not very much. An excellent question is a question the lecturer has a slide for. <laughs> um, So I hope I've convinced you that Lexeme is worthwhile. And but we have a lot of questions. Um, such as, how do I know what already exists in my language? Uh, there are many other questions like yours. How can we mass import a lot of words? Because it looks like a lot of work to put in manually. And it is a lot of work to put in manually. So the answer is yes, we can. Uh, bring it, uh, uh, bring bring words in um, in batch, and I will uh, demonstrate it if I have time. But I'll at least mention it here in the slide. But first, I want to show you something much more basic. Before you go and create a lexeme in your language, you should see if it maybe doesn't already exist. And the way you do that is you search for it. So you type L and then colon. Right, two dots. And then the lexeme that you want. For example, I'm going to switch to my exotic right to left language and type something. And I get results here. You see the result? And it's an L number. Do you see that? I'm enlarging it here. You see? 
I got a result of a lexeme and another lexeme. Both of them match what I typed. But remember to do the L colon, otherwise you're searching Wikidata items. So remember the L colon, and there's a little bug, unfortunately. The little bug, they're working on it, but it's still a bug as of right now, which is that when you type something like this, it will tell you, see, no match was found, which is discouraging, and it's lying to you. So it's a bug, okay? So don't trust this uh, pink no match was found. Press enter to do the actual search, and then you will find out whether or not there is something. Okay, so it's a bug. I, I hoped they would fix it before my talk, but they haven't. So uh, until they do, don't trust that thing. Click and en press enter to do the search, and then you will find the, the lexeme. And if you click it, you see here is a Hebrew lexeme. Um, you can't read it probably, but you can listen to it. That was me, by the way. I recorded that. So. <coughs> Uh, by the way, this is a noun. The previous example was a, was a verb. This is a noun. You can see that it has grammatical gender, right? Languages that have grammatical gender. This one is masculine. It has a usage example. It has senses. It has translations. It has translations. Um, another sense, forms, etc. Okay. So that was the way to know what already exists in your language. Okay. Um, everybody get that? The search box in Wikidata, L colon. Next, we want ways to browse what's already on Lexeme. I'm not looking for anything special, but I want to know what is there in Lexeme in my language. So. I will introduce you to two tools. One is called Hangor. Hangor. And the links are in the slides, and I'm going to share the slides after this talk in the channel. So don't worry about the links. You'll have all the links. Uh, this tool, Hangor, allows you to search or browse lexemes. So you can pick your language. And by the way, you can already see which are the languages with the largest number of lexemes. And the largest one currently is Russian, larger than English. Then Estonian, always punching above its weight. Uh, English, Malayalam, Swedish, Latin, Hebrew, German, etc. And if your language is not one of the top 20, do something about it. So let's look at one of them. Let's look at English to keep it easy. Um, and here we can just browse, just like a dictionary. We can look at all the lexemes that already exist, and we can also filter it. We can say, you know what? Don't give me lexemes that don't have any senses. Because a lot of people have put in uh, bunches of words programmatically, some of them are only forms and don't have any senses yet. Right? Someone just uploaded a whole bunch of words because they had the forms, but they didn't take the time to describe the senses. So I can, for example, say, you know what, I, I don't care about any words that don't have senses. And suddenly this list looks very different. Right? And I can browse this list, I can go to the next page, etc. I can search, right? I can search, I don't know, for the word oops, for the word food. And I found the word food. And I can have a link here to its lexeme page if I want to edit it. But I also have here, you can see the tool is kind of pulling from the Wikidata and giving me maybe a nicer uh, view of the lexeme. Uh, but again, this is a very primitive, simple uh, tool to just browse what's in there. Uh, if we take a language with a lot fewer uh, words, like, for example, let's pick a language that's represented here, Czech. Let's take Czech. And See what we have in the check. Hello. Browse. Browse. Check. Oh, Slovak. Slovak has even more than check. Nice. And now we can browse in Slovak, and I can take some word, and I can. <coughs> yeah, you can see that this word, for example, akter, has all of its 
forms in Slovak, the genitive, the dative, right? Akter, aktera, akterovi, etc. Um, but no senses. Nobody has put in any senses into the lexeme, the Slovak lexeme uh, of actor. So there's plenty of work, plenty of stuff to continue working on. So this is one tool, okay? Hangor. Just easy way to browse by language and see what's there. The other interesting tool is called Ordia. Ordia. And it gives you a number of possibilities to browse um, Lexeme. You can start by clicking languages here. And it runs a few queries and it gives you the top languages by Lexeme, which the other tool also gave us. But here we can actually see a number of other things. For example, we can see this graph. As you can see, it's running a Wikidata query in order to generate it. Here we go. Number of senses as a function of the number of lexemes. In other words, which languages have uh, more senses per lexeme, right? Uh, so you have all these statistics. Uh, I don't want to spend time on that right now, but let's look at, for example, uh, Russian. Now we zoomed in to Russian, and we have here some statistics about Russian. The number of senses in Russian lexemes is 11,000. 11,000, but they have 100,000 lexemes, which means there are about 90,000 without any sense, right? With only the form. So there's plenty of work to do in Russian as well. Um, we see here some, some lexemes as an example. We can look at the lexical categories as a bubble chart, and we can see that pretty much all the 100,000 <coughs> words in Russian so far are nouns. Someone has just put in a lot of nouns in Russian. And ad adjectives and verbs and other things are tiny, tiny minorities in this group. So again, it just gave me like a, an instant bird's eye view of that 100,000 uh, lexeme collection. Without this graph, I wouldn't have known. I would have had to just browse and, and get a sense myself. So it's a useful graph to give you kind of the shape. By, by comparison, by the way, let's compare. Uh, by comparison, if we go to Hebrew, for example, and look at the lexical categories, you can see it's a much more balanced view, right? We have a lot of nouns, but quite a few verbs and adjectives, and then proper nouns, adverbs, and other things, right? Uh, so it's a nice, useful tool to kind of just explore the statistics. We can also click further, and we get some examples of verbs. Etc. And it has, let's see, uh, yeah, you can also interrogate all kinds of things like grammatical features. So, across the entire lexeme, how many uh, forms do we have that are uh, genitive? How many forms do we have that are plural, uh, positive, etc.? Uh, it's just a tool for some statistics. You can explore it on your own. We don't have enough time to demonstrate it fully. There's also something called a lexical, lexicographical coverage report. This is a page that is generated, I think, about once a month on Wikidata. I remind you that the links are there. You can explore it later. And it gives you, per language, the, the lexeme situation for it. So, for example, let's take uh, Hebrew. And we have the number of... Uh, <laughs> yes. Let's take Hungarian. So, the number of forms in Wikidata is 135. There are barely any Hungarian lexemes on Wikidata. I'm looking at you, Gerber. Um, barely any lexemes on Wikidata. But this uh, process that runs once a month goes over a corpus including all of Wikipedia text, and it tries to extract lexemes from it to compare it, right, to try and understand how much of Wikipedia have we already covered, how much of the words in Wikipedia have we covered in lexeme. And you can see that it found 274,000 different forms of Hungarian words in Hungarian Wikipedia, 
And of them, only 135 uh, are already covered. So again, this is something to maybe motivate you. You can kind of see, it's like a progress bar for you of how much you have covered from your language. Uh, you can see that in Hebrew, for example, they found also about 250,000 forms in the Hebrew Wikipedia, and we already have even more forms than that in Lexeme, in Wikidata. But very few of them have census. So of these 348,000 forms, we have, uh, we're still missing, we're still missing a lot of the forms actually used in the encyclopedia. It's a bit confusing, I realize, so maybe we won't go into that. But it's an interesting tool. Once you get interested in Lexing, it's another interesting tool to kind of check your language's uh, coverage and progress on Lexing. Okay, so what about contributing to Lexing? I want you to create a new Lexing with me right now. Let's create a Lexing. How do we do that? We, well, let's go back. On Wikidata, on any page in Wikidata, wherever you are, you can click Create New Lexeme here on the sidebar. Okay, Create a New Lexeme. And when we create that, we get this page. And which language will, will we use? How about Macedonian to honor our hosts? Right? Okay. Let's use Macedonian. So the language of the Lexeme is Macedonian. Macedonian. And what word shall we use? How about masa? Yes, table? Masa. masa. Table? Masa. Masa. So uh, let's make sure it doesn't already exist. So we're looking for a lexeme called masa. And of course, there are some forms like that. But let's look carefully. This is Norwegian, Czech, Swedish, Basque, Spanish, Malay. Turkish, Czech, Slovak, uh, yeah, and but Hausa. I, but I think you, you, you need to use Cyril. I need to use what? Cyril. Cyril. Oh, Cyril. <laughs> yes, sorry. <laughs> You're right. That is a good point. Let us do that. But uh, it doesn't exist because I check it, it has only six lexemes. Six lexemes, and yeah, this is so one of them. No, but you're <laughs> right. See, we have masa in Bulgarian. Ooh. <laughs> we cannot let the Bulgarians uh, uh, have more words than we do, right? So, yes, let's create this lexeme. Thank you for the uh, reminder. Of course, it should be in Cyrillic. Okay, so, so uh, MK for Macedonian. And then the lemma, the lemma is the root form. Uh, the lemma is... Masa, no, Masa, right, yes. Now, the lexical category, the lexical category is noun, yes. right? That's a noun. Great. And that's it. And I click create. And now, Lexi knows about this word in Macedonian. And it only knows that apparently there is some lemma, Masa, in Macedonian, but it doesn't know anything about it. It doesn't know what gender it is. Macedonian doesn't have gender, right? Uh, no, it has. It has gender? Yes. Excellent. Yeah. So what gender is it? Feminine. 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 So we add a property here. We add a statement, just like on Wikidata, right? And we write gender. Now, this is Wikidata. So it gives you all kinds of properties including properties not relevant to lexemes. And that needs to be improved. At some point, it will more intelligently give you only the properties relevant to lexemes. But right now, you can see I type gender. And one of the options here is sex or gender of a human or animal. That's not the right property to use. OK? I need grammatical gender here. OK? Because we describe words with a different property. We describe them with grammatical gender. So I pick grammatical gender, and then I pick mask, uh, feminine. Feminine, right? Masa is feminine. And I click publish. And that's it. And now Lexi knows that this is a feminine noun. And what else? Let's add a sense. We're adding a sense. 
and we need to say in what language we're describing the sense, because we can do it in any language. So, <clears throat> I don't know how to define a table in Macedonian, so I'm going to leave that to Tony, okay. but I'll do it in English. Okay, I'll do it in English. English, and the gloss, the explanation, is... Um, flat surface... Uh, flat surface furniture, maybe? Right? It's a good, good enough for a start. Okay? So, it's a description of the word, again, not using a synonym, like really explaining what it means. Um, so that's uh, just my, my amateurish definition of a table. We can also add, I don't know, that it has legs or whatever. So this is a start. Now, one of you can add other languages to the sense, so that someone browsing Lexeme who doesn't speak English, but does speak, I don't know, Czech, could read a Czech explanation of what masa means in Macedonian. Right? Uh, okay, so this is one sense. I don't know if it has any other senses. And we can add a form. For adding a form, I have the representation. This is a technical term. It just means what does the word look like, right? So the representation of the word I'm going to add is masa. And it is, uh, whoops, it is singular, right? Constipation? What? <laughs> How did that get in there? Uh, it is singular. What else can I say about it, Tony? About this form? Uh, it's, no, it left a plural. Which no, no, but this form, masa, uh -huh. is singular, right? Singular. That's all I can yes, say yes, about yes, it. Because yes, yes, yes. you don't have cases, right? Cases is no, what you don't no, have. We don't have it. Yes, so it's not nominative or anything like that. It's just the singular form. Great. So this is F, F2. Why is it F2? That's weird. No, because I added. Ah, because you added. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was weird, the first form being F2. But someone <laughs> has been editing this lexeme. And as you can see, uh, he has added a form. And he's also added a sense. Yes. Uh, but hang on. Are you talking about the same sense as I am? Yeah, it's a flat. It's yeah, a so part it's not, of the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not a different sense. It's not sense number two. It's just the Macedonian for sense number one. Aha. Uh -huh. Right? So, it should so be... you should edit. You should click edit uh -huh. here and add the Macedonian to here and then remove this. Okay. Because you're not describing a different sense. Uh -huh. Right? You're adding another language to the description of the one sense. All right. Okay? So it's a good example. So it's a good demonstration. Can you Did add everybody follow that? Yes. It yes. wasn't a new sense of the word. So Maybe let's add uh, this a Wikidata item statement to the yes, sense. Yes, 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 yes. So at the lexeme level, not at the form or sense level, sorry, at the sense level, no, at the sense level, we need to say, okay, this sense of the word, we can say that there is a Wikidata item describing this concept, right? We have Wikipedia articles about the table. So we can say item for this sense, Item for this sense. And the item for this sense is table. You know, the Wikidata item table. Piece of furniture with a flat top. I was close. Furniture with a flat top. Uh, and we save it. And now, if we click this table, you can see that it takes us to Q14748, to a Wikidata item about the concept of table which of course includes everything we know about tables and links to Wikipedia articles about tables. So just this one link that we added can already help a computer trying to understand what this masa means. It goes, oh, this sense has a Wikipedia, has a Wikidata item which can lead me to Wikipedia articles which I can then show my user to help him understand what masa means. Do you see what I'm saying? Beyond the little translation I had here. I can already show my user uh, a, Wiki a Wikipedia article in their language about the concept that this Macedonian word means. So, uh, what is this thing you added? Masa za jadenje? For eating. For eating. Yeah, for eating. Table for eating. Table for eating. 
Uh, but that's not part of the lexicon. That's yeah, already, yeah, that's yeah, already yeah, an expression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's already an expression. But what we will add is the plural form, right? So let's add another. Whoops, sorry, not add property. Add form, and that's masi. 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 So um, switch to Cyrillic and ma si, like this, right? Yes. 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 And this is plural, and that's it. And of course, if it was a, if it were a verb, I would have more forms and more things to say: past, imperative, uh, etc. Uh, so it's a nominative as well. Well, in, in Macedonian, they don't have nominative. It turns out they have, uh, we don't have it. We case. have articles. They no. don't have cases. Isn't that amazing? We not. <laughs> yeah, they have the definite the article. They have a form for the table. Um, so we can actually add it. What is the form? Masata. Masata. Yes. Masata. So we have an article in Macedonian language. Yes. So they have the definite article meaning the, right? So we can add in Cyrillic masata or masava. But that's a different one. Masava is here. Yeah. It's not the table. It's this table. It's this table. That's a different thing. It's not the article. It's a demonstrative pronoun. This. So this one is um, singular, right? It's singular, but with a definite pronoun, right? It's definite. It's singular and definite. That's the, the, the form here. So uh, if you're thinking to yourself, oh, wow, this requires like grammatical terms. Uh, yes, it does. I mean, if you're going to describe your language, you, you need to describe it in grammatical terms. And if you are unsure of the grammar in your language, then um, you know, look it up, uh, refresh your memory from school, or recruit a friend who does, and you can do it together. Okay, so, and of course, we can also add the uh, definite plural form, and the this form, and the that form. I won't do it now, you get the idea, right? So we have just created a brand new lexeme, and I hope it's one of many that will be created in Macedonian going forward. And all of these are tools to help you create lexemes. So we just did it kind of the manual, simple, direct way, but there are faster ways. For example, here is a tool called Lexeme Forms. And it's basically a form that you can fill with all the forms of a certain word, and it already creates the lexeme for you with all the forms and, and things, so you don't have to click add form, mk, uh, you know, again and again. Do you see what I mean? So, uh, I don't know if it has Macedonian yet, because nobody has made it. So this tool is based, if you click, if you go to the tool, and the URL is in the slide, right, but later, if you go to the tool, click documentation, you will see that the author of the tool, our colleague Lukas Welkmeister, is happy to create new forms for your languages, he just doesn't know your languages. So he needs you to kind of create a template, and then he will add it to the tool. I'll give you an example. Let's take um, something... There is Latvian. Latvian? Yeah, Latvian. Cool. And this is Latvian yeah. what? Noun? Yeah. Noun. Uh, Noun. Feminine and masculine. Great. So, uh, yeah, I need to yeah. log in. But yeah, it's in Latvian, the interface too. I need to log in, and yeah, and it probably requires all kinds of characters. It will be difficult for me to create. But the point is, uh, walk us through this, uh, Martin. This is basically prompting us to fill in the right form of the word. So the nominative. Yeah, and the singular and pure, uh, plural form of uh, each. Singular and plural. But what is what is this? Uh, this is like a exa usage examples. Yeah. Right? So that you don't not need to know what is nominative and what is. No, I understand. Dating. What does it say literally? Uh, this is a, a dog. This is a dog. Right. So this these words here before the field are just to help you in your mind so that you're not confused about wait genitive dative what does it mean? It just gives you kind of a sentence to complete. And if you're a native speaker of your language, this should be trivial for you, right? So if you say, this is a dog, or whatever noun I'm adding now, 
I will naturally be able to type in the correct form. And if this says, I don't know, this belongs to the dog, or I don't know, what does it say? Yeah, this is this belongs to the dog. That's cool. Yeah. So it, it gives you this form, and you just you just type these words, and in the end you press the button, and it creates a lexeme with, you know, ten forms or seventeen forms or however many forms Latvian needs. So it's a very nice little tool. You still have to type, you know, all the forms of the word, but you type them in one form and then click the button and it creates the whole lexeme. It's a, a lot fewer clicks than going on the Wikidata itself and clicking add form, Macedonian, you know, or Latvian. Uh, so it just saves some work and you can add templates for your languages, for nouns, for adjectives, for verbs. Uh, it's not complicated. So that's one uh, tool. Here's another one. No, you know what? I, I won't have time to demonstrate all of these. So, I will just mention some of the coolest ones. And one of the coolest ones is Lingua Libre. Do you know Lingua Libre? How many of you know Lingua Libre? Almost none of you. Amazing. So, Lingua Libre, again, the link is there, <clears throat> is a tool created by our French colleagues. And what it does it is a tool for recording pronunciations. You feed it a list of lexemes, and it presents you with the word, and you just speak. You just sit in front of your computer and speak. You don't have to press anything. It just shows you a word, you say it. Shows you another, two seconds later, it shows you another word, you say it. Two seconds later, and it automatically uh, cuts the audio files and names them and uploads them to Commons for you, and links them to the lexemes. So it's amazing. And it, yes, it will need to use my microphone. And unfortunately, we don't have time for a real full demo, but I'm eager to demonstrate it. So we can maybe find a break or something, and I will demonstrate it to whoever wants to, or maybe we'll do, no, tonight we have a city tour. So I don't know uh, if there will be some other time to do a makeup session. I'll gladly demonstrate it, but it has documentation, it's not too difficult. What is difficult is feeding it the words, like finding the, the list of words to feed it, and for that, I recommend a query. We don't have time to go into uh, how to query Lexeme, but anyway, that requires you to learn Sparkle first. So you should learn Sparkle. This link, if you don't know Sparkle yet, that's the language that you query with, this link will take you to a two-hour tutorial by me about Sparkle. So you can imagine that I taught you Sparkle, and after that, you can build your own queries or still <coughs> adapt uh, queries by other people. And if you click the Adapt Queries, you will be taken to my Lexine query page from which you can steal ready-made queries. And for example, you can see this query is a query for a batch of words that needs pronunciation that can be fed directly to Lingua Libre. So if you go to Lingua Libre, you will see there's a place there where you can paste a query, just paste the query as it is. Now this query is set to Hebrew here. Q2, Q, Q9288 is Hebrew. Just change this number to the Q number for your language, and this query, take it as it is, feed it to Lingua Libre, and it will show you words in your language that need pronunciation, and then you can uh, pronounce them. Of course, if your language it just doesn't exist in Lexine yet, you will first have to feed those words in. And there are tools in my slide, there are tools here that also help with that. We don't have time to discuss them, unfortunately, but you can explore them on your own or catch me later. Uh, and in my last minute, I will just show you a fun thing that was was created on an HTTP website. A fun thing that was built over Lexine. This one is a study aid for people learning German. German nouns have gender, and it's very hard to learn the gender of nouns in a language that isn't your native language. So this little game is giving you a word, and it asks you, der, die, oder das? Is it masculine, feminine, or neuter in German? Right? The word is Wichtelmann here. And I guess that's a der. 
and I submit it, and I was correct. I got one point. See the plus one there? And Abkühlens Prozess. Das. Let's go with das. Das Prozess. No, it's der Prozess, isn't it? Yeah, that was wrong. It's der, see? So it, it was wrong, I didn't get points, and I'm told that it's der. So it's uh, uh, masculine. So it's just a silly little game. It's very simple. Anyone who can program can do this very easily uh, based on the documentation in Lexeme. And to prove this to you, so this was made by a, a French, uh, our French colleague from Wikimedia Germany, and I made this for Ukrainian. Vin vona vonon, right? He, she, or it in Ukrainian. And you can see I just took the same software, I changed a few of the queries, and now this thing is asking you about noun gender in Ukrainian. And you can do this for your language with very minimal adjustments as well. This was just for fun. This is one of the simplest applications uh, of uh, Lexeme possible. So we're out of time. My, my next steps that I recommend to you, these are early days, so you can still have a lot of influence on Lexeme, on how it's developed, on how the interface develops, on what tools are built. There's, there's an appetite right now to build tools to make people use Lexeme. So, you know, if you start using it and say, you know what, I could really use something that does this, there are good chances people will build it for you. So it's a good time to get involved with uh, Lexeme. So I encourage you to go explore it on your own, add Lexemes in your language, look for uh, existing Lexemes in your language and add forms and senses and usage examples and pronunciation audio to it and show Lexeme to your peers back home in your communities. You can use my slides so that they too can become Lexeme hipsters. <laughs> Thank you very much.